Well, in today's installment of A Robot Just Stole Your Job, you report that an elite fighter pilot and retired Air Force colonel has just been beaten in an air combat simulation by an AI running a $35 Raspberry Pi, running on a $35 Raspberry Pi. Tell us about this. Yeah, this was fascinating because, you know, flight simulators are, and, uh, have been around for a while and, and the Air Force is, uh, is obviously very, very keen to, to try and look for ways to augment its, pilot, its pilot's abilities. Um, what you got with this was, I mean, usually you think, when you think sort of machine intelligence, you think some server somewhere, but this was, as you say, just a Raspberry Pi, a 35 quid bit of equipment. Although I get the feeling if some American military manufacturers sell it to the government, they'll charge about 10 grand for it, uh, based on past performance. But it was the the alpha system was amazingly good. Now they were going up against, you know, admittedly a retired Air Force colonel, but still someone who's taught thousands of, of pilots how, how to dogfight, and has been using AI and has been trying out computer simulated um, uh, piloting systems for the last couple of decades. And it beat him hollow. He couldn't get a kill on it at all. He got killed every time. And this was after they'd handicapped the AI by giving it shorter range of missiles, less maneuverability, uh, no radar coverage over the air, over the sort of combat area which the the human pilot had. The fact that you can actually beat someone like uh, you could beat someone with that level of skill on such a consistent basis did make me think that, quite frankly, you know, the current generation of Top Guns are going to be the last. Um, because there are enormous advantages about taking humans out of the cockpit, and um, there are also a few a few major disadvantages. But if from an Air Force point of view, and from the other arms of the U.S. military, because let's not forget, I think it's the U.S. Army has the second largest Air Force in the world. You know, this is there's an awful lot of hardware out there which this could be applied to. Yeah, you say it's great for the pilots, but I mean, there's a big moral question here, right, too? I mean, you know, you're saving the life of the pilot, but not the people, not, you know, not if there's a human pilot in the other <laughs> plane or, you know, it's, it's a big drone question, right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a moral question that I can't yes, answer. Yes, I, I think this is, this is very important because one of the things that stops politicians deciding to go to war quite so often is the thought of all those people receiving telegrams from the War Department saying that we regret to inform you that your son or daughter has been killed in a foreign land. Um, when you've got systems like this, then it's going to be an awful lot easier to deploy them and to go to war, but it's that's very little comfort for the... Um, you know, for the people on the ground who are, who are getting the missiles uh, thrown at them somewhat, uh, either accidentally or on purpose. Uh, that's the old joke, what's the difference between an Afghan wedding and a ter terrorist camp? Don't ask me, I just fly the drone. But um, it's, you know, there are serious moral questions which we're going to have to face. With the growth of AI and with the growth of systems like this, we are going to have to come to sort of really some deep thinking about how we deploy these systems, whether we deploy them, and the level of control with which we, you know, with which we keep them under, under you know, under our, under our grip, as it were. Um, are there questions that, you know, people are already raising, but I'm not seeing much movement on, on the part of the military in terms of providing some decent answers. Yes, I mean, we've been talking over the past week about self-driving cars and the ethics of self-driving cars. There was the John Markoff story about programming, you know, the trolley problem, mm -hmm. programming who you're going to run into. And we got a lot of mail saying, you know, you look at the statistics and self-driving cars are safer and they're going to have to make that choice fewer times than people can. can. And, you know, but we're sort of rolling this over in our minds a lot. But then you think about drones and, you know, AI fighter pilots and it's already going on. We're already there. Someone's already making those decisions on behalf of our, you know, military. So I'm glad oh, it's indeed. not me. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the self-driving car one is really interesting because... If you put it to somebody logically, is it better for one person to die or four person, four people to die in a car crash? You know, if a car is going out of control, or is is going to face a crash, which is the which is the the better solution? And almost everyone will be well. It's better, you know, that just one person dies. But then when it's you in the car and the car is deciding to crash into something solid rather than into somebody else to save their lives, then I don't think buyers are going to be too keen on that one. Um, and I think they're going to have to find a way to to really sell this to people or improve the software to such a, to, to such a point. But software, you know, software control cars do seem to be pretty safe in the limited testing that we've had so far.